Okay, everybody, welcome once again to uh, our fourth session of We Are Pilgrims on This Earth, our, our summer season um, Wednesday night remote study that we do uh, on and off throughout the whole year. Sometimes we read books together. It's a book study. Sometimes we bring in, in particular authors who also join us in their book study. Sometimes we'll have studies on particular topics with various speakers, and sometimes it's just me or, or someone else talking on a, on a particular topic. Uh, and uh, we have decided this summer, since Prezutera, Kristen and I had just recently come back from a pilgrimage to Egypt to make the entire summer, since that's a time when we're going on vacation and traveling and, and doing our own pilgrimage, to, to focus on places of pilgrimage for Orthodox Christians throughout the world, uh, but we started with Egypt. We ended up doing three sessions in Egypt, um, including St. Catherine's. Now we're going to cover some other of the areas in uh, the Holy Land, in Palestine, Israel, and Jerusalem. Uh, and then uh, the other, if you've, if you've seen the invitations that I've sent out, uh, or if you're listening to this, some of the other places that we hope to visit uh, together by either hearing someone present who has gone on pilgrimage there, uh, or even uh, speaking with someone who is at these locations, are St. Tikhan's Monastery, uh, the Monastery of St. Um, John in Essex, England, founded by St. Sophroni. Um, uh, maybe but many of us know Ayas Kepi, but maybe um, we'll talk about Ayas Kepi, which is a monastery pretty much close to us uh, here in, in, in that's in the Poconos. We're we're down in Reading now. Uh, we also will hopefully talk to Father Mark um, Leisure and have him talk about his uh, church of St. George, the Carpathian Russian Orthodox Church that is the home for uh, the Cardiatusa Mershuning icon. And we'll see where else we might we might go before we're finished uh, for the summer. So Tonight we have Maria Curry, Dr. Maria Curry. I'm not going to give her uh, a, a very long introduction, just to say that, um, that uh, Dr. Maria has lived a fascinating life. Uh, it has not been an easy life at all, but it's been a life of, of obedience to Christ and the gospel as best she can, of following her husband um, to, to wherever he has chosen to, to go and raise her children in not the easiest conditions, but at the same time to be very aware of all the blessings that are all around her, having spent, um, how 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 long have you been in and out of Taipei, Maria? The last, was it 1991 to today? So the first time I, I have come was 1983. So for the, 40, for the 45 years that I know my husband, Daoud Khoury, David Khoury, I've been living here Full time since after the Oslo Agreement, that's in 1993, when Israel and Palestinian leaders in front of the White House were shaking hands that they would have peace, that they would have the two state solution. So, um, almost 30 years for me being here. Yeah. And in and uh, out. In, in and out, right. Because but you, my first visit, 1983. You're not allowed to be granted Palestinian. Um, uh, 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 papers, uh, citizenship, right? Father Theodore, I'm, 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 uh, I am a Palestinian citizen, but I don't want to be because Palestinian citizens, like my husband, are not allowed to go anywhere. You need a permit to do anything and everything. You need a permit to go to Jerusalem. You need a permit to travel. You just need a permit. And I like being an American, or I like being a Greek, because when you're an international, you can go in and out of Jerusalem. You can go anywhere. Uh, as long as you have, uh, you know, visitor visa on your I international see. passport. But it means then that you cannot, you can't stay any longer than three months yes, at a time. I cannot. I've lived all my life since 1983. And especially since uh, I've been living here with my children and my husband after we returned here after the Oslo Agreement in 1993. Uh, I've been living a three month life according to the Israeli security laws so that I can be a legal vi visitor so that I can legally go in and out. 
And I just can't believe that the Lord has helped me to do this over 30 years, to tell you the truth, because, and right now, after this conversation, in case somebody's with CIA with you, it's not going to happen anymore, but whatever. Maria, for those of you who may be watching this now or are tuning in later, Maria woke up at two in the morning to join us uh, uh, from Palestine, from the town that we're going to hear about, which is a place where Jesus visited after his raising of Lazarus and shortly before his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The town today is called Taipei. It's the biblical city of Ephraim, which has its own his history uh, within the life of the Jews as well. And Maria's going to talk to us about, about all of that. So Maria, uh, what, I'm, what we're doing today is kind of entering the way that I, I have the last four times entered Jerusalem. We land in the Tel Aviv airport. We make our way to, to the um, Taipei Golden Hotel that's owned by uh, the Corey family uh, to get a, a some type of uh, rest and and sleep and so you we wake up our first day in taipei in the ho in the holy land so your your start of learn hearing about um the the holy land and palestine and and israel is starting the way our, our last four programs did in in taipei and it's a very unique unique perspective and i think you'll understand much more fully why i wanted to start this way as well in talking about the Holy Land. So Maria, what I'm gonna do now is pull up the slideshow. Did you have a chance to look at it? That's good, so I can see it because I can't even download it. My Wi-Fi is so weak. I, oh, saw, no. I saw okay. the maps, I saw the maps, but it's just so that slow that I couldn't see the rest. Okay, all right, well. Oh, thank you, I'm sure it's a wonderful slideshow. Well, it, 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 I added some things to what you, to the pictures that you sent me. Um, and but it's important if people could see the map because what is happening here is that 22 percent of the land that was supposed to be palestine and and 78 percent of the land that was supposed to be israel in the 1993 um signing of peace you know such a small amount of land for palestine uh this never happened and this small amount of palestine continues to be exploited by settlers, uh, Israeli settlers, uh, where Jews are building Jewish homes for Jews only. So there's hardly any land left from the small little 28% that they thought could be Palestine. So we're living in a very hopeless situation where it's been a frozen peace for 30, for more than 30 years, actually, since 1993, when they signed. Maria, what I'm going to ask you to do, so you, yes, the first slide that we have in this uh, in this PowerPoint is actually a map, but I want you to take us back a little bit and give us uh, a short version, five, five to seven minutes about how it is that you ended up there, how it okay, is that well, you met, your, met a Palestinian so and married him and so the forth. Way that I, is that the way that I ended up here in Taiba is that myself being a Greek person born in Greece and Tripoli, Greece from a Greek mom, a Greek dad, I had immigrated to the United States where most Greeks, most Italians, most, you know, people from around the world want to go to America for a better future, better education. That's how my mom and dad took me there. I was five years old. I grew up in Denver, Colorado, very Greek strict home where my mother and father are very scared of American culture and everything Greek is good. So we go to the Greek church, we have a Greek doctor, we have a Greek dentist, we go to the Greek shop, Greek lawyer, Greek, 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 everything Greek is good, American is just bad. And so thank God there's Hellenic College. It's the only Greek college at that time uh, where Greek girls are supposed to live at home and go to college and come back to their home. And then you only leave your home when you get married to go to your husband's home. But since everything Greek is good, I told my mom and dad, can I please go to this Greek college? So uh, um, uh, since everything Greek is sacred, I went to Helena College, but I met the only non-Greek boy there, which was my husband, David Corey, Daoud Corey. And it was very interesting. Yeah, everyone's Greek. And they thought I would meet a nice Greek guy that's going to be a priest, but it just didn't happen. And then my husband is very loyal, very dedicated to his country. He was born 
here in Jerusalem. He lives in Taiba, the city, uh, the city of Jerusalem is about half an hour from this small town of Taiba where Jesus came here. We are biblical Ephraim in a biblical uh, map, but Ephraim was changed in the 12th century. Uh, we stopped using the name Ephraim and we picked up the name Taiba by the Islamic leader, Salah Adin, because he called the local Christians Taibin because most people here that are Christian follow the gospel of love, love your neighbor, love your enemy. So the first people that converted when Jesus was in the village, whether they were Greek or Jew or, or um, Gentile or Roman, whatever they were, they were baptized onto Christ, took on Christ. So this little village has beautiful roots of 2000 years of Christian witness. But anyway, um, <laughs> They follow the gospel of love. So the 12th century, we stopped using the name Ephraim and we're known by the name Taibe, which means good or pleasant in, in Arabic, named by Salah Hadim. So I ended up here because my husband, after college, of course, wants to return to his hometown. I didn't really want to come here because there's no freedom here. People can't go anywhere. We live under guns. Israel controls the air, the roads, the land, the natural resources. We don't have water five days a week, we don't have, we are not allowed to have running water because there's a water shortage. So as Palestinians, we are last in priority to get water. All of the settlers around us, the uh, Jewish settlements get water seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So this is like a huge, big discrimination that's happening here on the ground because if all people were doing without water, you'd say, this is what we're doing to prolong the water use but when you have only one set of people doing without water the rest of the people have swimming pools green grass and 24 hours seven days a week water that's just pure discrimination so it's that's what's my contrary, to, contrary to what was discussed in in uh washington dc this week where you know someone someone called uh, one someone in government i forget who it was i think it was a representative or a senator or someone said Israeli is, Israel is a, is a discriminatory country and and the Israelis are di discriminatory people and they and immediately the the media and so forth you know made the person apologize for making a comment uh, like this publicly so we understand that the plight of uh, special the Palestinians and in some sense especially the Christians is is a very dire one and you don't know that when you go on pilgrimage per se and you don't visit the christians themselves that are still living there you don't know that if you visit if you don't go to towns like uh um taipei where there is a sign in hebrew outside of the town a huge huge sign that says you're taking your life into your own hands if you enter into this town though the town is the last 100 percent Christian town in all of Palestine, and uh, you, you're you're probably safer in that town than in lots of other places. Um, right now, we're seeing the I, I the first map that I put in the in the show. Oh no, what did I do? Let me get back. Uh, the first map that I put in was just so we can make a bridge. Here we are. Here we were studying for the last uh, our first three sessions. Here in the in Egypt and in the Nile Basin, that beautiful green area. Then the, our last session, we went all the way down to here. You can see the pointer. That's Mount Sinai and the, the Monastery of St. Catherine's. We had we had uh, Nietzsche give us that wonderful talk. And now we've moved up into the heart of the Holy Land. And as you saw, I, I had focused in a little bit. So in relation to the city of Bethel, is that an ancient name or is that is that a, a still a modern name, Maria? Where is no, Taipei is not on I, this map. I, I mean, Taipei is not on this map because we worked so hard for three years to put Taipei on the map. And uh, I'm sorry I didn't send you one of my maps that has Taipei on okay. it, Father. But, I have, but I have I'm, more I'm maps. across from Jericho. I'm across from Jericho. So when you see Jericho, I'm 10 minutes up the mountain from the mountain. Okay, and so Jericho is on this map. You can see yeah. Jericho. So if you see Jericho... You just go a little arrow to the left, and I'm 10 here's, minutes up from the Mount of Temptation. Here's Jericho, so right around here. So below Bethel and to the east of Gezir, I guess. 
Because uh-huh. this is a, an Israeli map you're using. So you have all of the ancient Hebrew names right. that are, and that's what the settlements are based on, on Hebrew the, names. That's why for me, I'm in Taibe, which is Ephraim, but next to me is the Ofra settlement because Ofra is the Hebrew name for Ephraim. Oh, okay. And that's why we have a, a, a Jewish settlement. Well, we have many Jewish settlements because Jewish settlements are closing in on Arab villages. In Bethlehem, it's surrounded by a huge big wall and there's 22 illegal settlements closing in on Bethlehem trying to squeeze the people out. Here in Taiba, we have four settlements all around us. But Ofra, which is the Hebrew name for Ephraim. Oh, I forgot to lock the... I'm going to keep talking and put the phone like this. All right, um, and you can I'm continue gonna... to ask me another question. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm going to explain a little bit more. So. Um, I, the next slide that I put on is actually not something that Maria sent me, but um, in one of my early pilgrimages, we got to go to Jordan. And in Jordan, there's a church in the city of Madaba, uh, St. George. And um, just picture the entire Salea of your church that may be like 60 feet wide uh, by 35 or 40 feet uh, tall as one mosaic, but not a mosaic of a double-headed eagle or of something else along those lines, a mosaic that's actually a map of the Holy Land. This sixth century mosaic shows just the importance of pilgrimage for the life in the early church, that people would literally pass through here. And I'll I'll focus in a little bit more on the map. and you can, uh, this is only, this is, this is the mosaic that's the clearest that's showing it's there, there, it's, it's much larger than this, but um, like right around here is Jerusalem. You can see the walls around the Jerusalem. Uh, of course, it's not made in scale, but the, the point that I show this ancient, uh, this ancient city in Jordan is just to show pilgrims how important, how amazingly important pilgrimage is to the Christian life, um, that they would actually make the floor of a church a map, uh, which is, you know, it's kind of iconographic because there's many detail, details in it that also show us some of the theology of the church. I don't want to go, go into that too much, but very, very famous church, a famous map, the Madamba map, um, that is 1,400 years old. Here's, here's another map, um, the Holy Land. And in this map, we can see a little bit more closely, you know, um, all of the, the, the Holy Land. And for the first time, we're seeing a map that says Taipei. So you see right here, here's Taipei. And you can see it is north of Jerusalem. Uh, it is east or west of Jericho. And it is south of Jacob's well and Sevastia. Um, anything else that you wanna you wanna say, Maria? Before I we go to, um, well, I do have one more map. I thought you would like to comment on this when you come back, and can and can look at this, Maria. It's a map showing. I don't know exactly when this map was made, but it's showing the Palestinian territories. So it 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 doesn't. It's not dated to say. When exactly? Um, whoops, I went ahead. When, when, when exactly? But it does have a little um, caption at the bottom says, uh, "If I can move this a little bit, so I can read it uh, more more easily." The purpose of this map is to illustrate travel regions. This is not a political endorsement of any claims over the sovereignty of these territories. So that just says something about what's going on in Israel right now. So can you see this map at all, Maria? Yeah, I, know I see it. And this, is, and this map is now the 22%, but all of this now is taken over by Israel, and there's hardly any left land to be Palestine. I wish so I all of this green you, was what was meant to be Palestine. What was meant to be Palestine, and now, and it's only 28%. And this is filled with 600,000 settlers, and these 250 settlements with these 600 settlers have, you know, occupied this green, and there's hardly any green left. And in the midst of all of that political turmoil and and really kind of a, a, a planned, a planned 
slow um, pogrom and uh, and a removal of of the of the indigenous population um, of Palestinians, the the people there continue to live, and those who are at the holy sites continue her courageously to be present to offer to all the pilgrims that come the opportunity to to venerate and to grow and to experience what pilgrims throughout the centuries have experienced before. Now we're now we're closing in on Palestine. Can you see this picture? I mean, closing in on Taipei. Can you see this picture, Maria? Um, yeah, this is, Taibay. you know what I wanted to say, Father, about the church in Marba that you mentioned, this is very significant to show our existence. And that's very beautiful that in that mosaic, Ephraim and Taiba exist because it shows that we were a Christian community in the sixth century, which uh, confirms our oral history that, well, it's not just oral history, but we're documented in the gospel of John 11, verse 54, that Jesus escaped from the Jewish community in Jerusalem to come to Ephraim. So, and that's when the first church was built here in the fourth century, because St. Helen, when she heard stories of where Jesus is born, where Jesus was crucified, where the first miracle happened, she wanted to document the footsteps of Christ. So here in our village, when she was told that Jesus came here right before his holy passion, we think that's why she asked for the church to be built, which is now the beautiful fourth century ruins, which is named after St. George because her son, Constantine the Great, was the first one to allow churches to be named after St. George. So, you know, the original church is next to the airport, but our church here is also named St. George. And I'm going to tell you a little secret about St. George. So by the end of the Bible study, why all the churches are named St. George. So I moved the slide to the Church of St. George in Taipei. Uh, it's, of course, now um, just the walls remaining and the floor remaining and a few of the of the columns and so forth. Uh, if If you can see... I, I, I did just a, uh, one more picture of kind of entering in and getting a sense of what Taipei looks like today as a, as a more modern Palestinian city. And, but then, but then I, I kind of started all of the pictures in Taipei uh, with the, the picture from St. George, because that is uh, for us the most important of significance. If you can see, I don't know if you can see this, Maria, because you're just looking at your phone, but Everyone yeah, no, you know what I'm doing? I'm going to send you something. I'm going to send you something on your phone so you could please show everybody because it's showing what, um, how much of Palestine is left. So that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to get a map to send you, Father. All right. All right. Um, and Sorry. if you're able to do that and talk, by all means, go ahead. So no, we want you to I'm continue to tell to... us a little bit about more about St. George in Taipei. Uh, so St. George in Taiba was uh, asked to be built by St. Helen in the 4th century, but now the church is in, you know, natural destruction. It was destroyed just by nature. It wasn't destroyed by invasions, but it's a beautiful archaeological site that you have seen. And it's very much a place where we go light our candles. And it's the place where my son was married, you know, last week. So it's just a very beautiful space in honor of St. George. Congratulations. Um, Not, I, I only congratulated you for the baptism of, of uh, Elena's <laughs> second child, okay. Hannah, and I didn't congratulate you for your son's wedding. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so it was outdoors. You. This is the altar. Outdoors. Is this the altar area site. that you see in the phone? Yes. And please, Father, I've sent you on your phone how much of the green is left? What was green that you showed everybody was in, before um, 1967. Right. And I've sent you on your phone how much of the green is left, which is hardly anything. I don't know if you're able to get it from your phone and to share it with everyone, but I, 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 might, to I might be able to. I'm sending it right now I, to my email. I, 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 I just wanted to tell you that the map that you showed, which is the West Bank, uh, has continued since 1967 when Israel took over the West Bank to build Jewish homes for Jews only. So in that small 
28%. We hardly have any green left. And we're losing our hope as, as Christian people. We keep our hope in Christ. Um, but, but at any rate, I... Um, at any rate, I, I just wanted to point that out about the map and about the Mataba Church to say how significant it is that our space, Taibe Ephraim, is on the map in the church in Meraba in Jordan, which shows our Christian location tracing back uh, 1,600 years. Because it yeah. showed the first Christian communities at that time, which were in Bethlehem, Jerusalem, us here in Ephraim, Taibe, and the churches in uh, Jordan when so, Christianity started to spread. I believe this view, Maria, is looking out of the church towards yes. another part of Taipei. What's yes. who, what, is that the Roman Catholic church that's on the left with the so, blue? So, so? so the first thing we're looking at is the Melchi church on the left, the which Melchite is also church. called St. George. So the first church, we have Melchite practice here, and that's called the St. George Greek Catholic Church, which means St. George Melkite practice. For Melkite, we use the word Greek Catholic here. And for the Roman Catholic, we use the local word Latin, which is, I don't know if it's in this picture, it's a clock tower. The clock tower is the Is this it right Latin here, church. all the way on the right-hand side, Maria? You see where the point yeah. pointer is? Is, is, there, yeah. is there a clock on the right side? That's the uh, Roman Catholic Church, but here we yep. say uh, That's Latin. It. That's it. That's the clock tower. Okay. Uh -huh. um, anything else that you want to say about this picture before I move on? About the Melkite Church, St. George, and about the Roman Catholic Church. That's the Church well, of the Well, Redeemer So those Union. are the three Christian communities that share Taipei, right? The the Palestinian Orthodox, the, the, the Latin, and the Melkites. Yes, that share St. George. Uh, that share, share Taipei. They share this, that, the, the city of Taipei. Yes, our our local churches are the Greek Orthodox Church, the Latin Church, which is Roman Catholic, and the Melkite Church, which is the Greek Catholic, yes. And they're all St. George? The three churches are St. George, the archaeological site, the Melkite Church, and our Church of St. George. And the clock tower, the Latin Church, is the Church of the Redeemer, which shows Christ coming into the village, remembering Jesus coming into the village uh, 2,000 years ago. Our next slide, uh, it takes us to the first view of the uh, five, is it five star, four star, five star 30, hotel? 30,000 30, olive trees in front of the four star, 80 room Taiba Golden Hotel. Oh, that's a nice picture, Father. Where'd you get that? Online. <laughs> oh wow! It's amazing Someone how many pictures photo. come up if you just Google <laughs> Tai Bay and uh, the the Tai Bay Golden Hotel. That's I a put, lovely photo. I have I to use that myself. <laughs> three or four of them in. So, do you want to tell us a little bit about the history of the hotel? The history of the hotel is Dawood Puri, well, my husband, let's go having back. no sorry. idea what I'm, to do. <laughs> I want to. I want to. I want to. Forgive me. I want to backtrack. So, tell us about the Corey family in Taipei and and the Corey um, family's relationship so, with the church of Taipei. So actually my my husband David Corey came to study at Helena College because there's a tradition Corey means priest in Arabic so every generation must serve in the church and his cousin was at Helena College Bishop Dimitri Corey so you kind of go to Australia to Great Britain to America anywhere you have a relative that would help you study so my husband came to Helena College to study for that reason, but he just, yeah, you know, he didn't have being a priest in him, although before I die, he might be a priest. I have no idea since he's been a professor, an entrepreneur, a mayor, you know, many things, he might be a priest, but he gave up his scholarship for a master's in business, worked two jobs to get a master's, I mean, instead of getting the free master's in theology scholarship, he worked two jobs to get the master's in business because he just you know loved business so much but then when we returned here after the Oslo agreement when we thought Israel and Palestine uh, were going to put the differences aside and there was going to be freedom he wanted to help build the Palestinian economy like many Palestinian 
people were invited to come back uh, after 1993. And so he started with Nadim Khoury, my brother-in-law, who was also my classmate at Helena College, the first microbrewery in the Middle East. This became a very well-known microbrewery because no one was doing German style beer here in the whole region. So now many people are doing such a thing in Greece and in Cyprus and in Jordan and in uh, Lebanon. But uh, my husband, David Khoury, with his brother, Nadim Khoury, and my brother-in-law, Nadim Khoury, was the first master brewer to make Taiba beer. And then also now we have the first Palestinian boutique wine, and it's at the lobby of the Taiba Golden Hotel on the left. And then on the right, we have a new project, which is the first Palestinian brew pub in Palestine. So you're going to see some changes when you come, Father, because that's new before Corona. And uh, th these things are meant to try to do some good nonviolent action in the small Christian village because Palestinians are brought to everyone as terrorists. Uh, we brought, we're brought without a face. And in the Taiba Golden Hotel, I tried to have beautiful art up from well-known artists to show people who come to visit that we have people that can do beer, wine, beautiful art, embroidery. So some of the well-known artists like Sliman Mansour, Taisir Barakat, Nabil Anani, I have kept one uh, uh, painting from each of the exhibits that I used to do, uh, bringing 18 pieces of art so whoever comes uh, can see the work of local artists. And we've been doing that since 2005 when I was helping my husband to do the Taiba Oktoberfest, the village festival, just out of desperation. So having what high unemployment what, here. What you're trying to do is save the village and save its history and save its Christian. Yeah, we didn't know we're trying to do this. We just were trying to do things day by day to keep the community here. So the first project that we ever did was the Taibe St. George Orthodox Housing Project, which we saw how people that were Protestant and people that were Roman Catholic across the board in the West Bank, whether they lived in Jerusalem, in, in Bethlehem, in Berzeit, next to us, everyone, and in Taibe, they were building homes to help Christians live here because people are squeezed out because they can't afford to live here uh, from the wars and the occupation and the high cost of living. So they like to go to Australia or to America or to Great Britain just to put food on the table for their children. So housing is a very important thing. So if you have a home and then you have a job and then you can afford to send your kids to school, uh, these are three very basic things that will help you stay in a community. So the first project in 2000, that actually was my father-in-law's idea, but he became very sick. Uh, having dialysis and dying in a hospital in Boston, he started a project to help local Orthodox Christians from St. George uh, Church have affordable housing. I didn't want his project to be a failure. And at that time, I actually lost my real job working in the schools because the uprising had happened. And being under curfew and uh, you know, being an educated person and not having anything to do in a little village, and I was about to go crazy. So I thought, well, I go to America anyway, and I bring my books to churches. Like Christina goes to the whole. Uh, Christina goes to church. Christina learns the sacraments. Christina's counting books. So I'm visiting churches once in a while, and I'm trying to stock up the churches. Why don't I tell churches that my church needs help with building homes? So it started like this in the year 2000, and by the time my husband. Uh, David Khoury became the mayor in 2005. Uh, we started to more actively ask for funds. And it was very difficult because it was very hard to bring checks to the West Bank and to cash them because by the time people send you a check and it gets here, the mail is very bad. So the check expires. So people would send me Christmas cards, but I would actually get them after Easter. So it would say Merry Christmas, but, but you know, if you're a Christian, it's Christmas every day. So I guess it was all good that I was giving them at Easter. Now I'm getting off the topic, but the first project it's okay. we did was you're, helping you're people. You're forgiven. It's two in the morning. But okay. um, 
So the it's first now, project it's was now quarter helping of, people build houses. It's now quarter of three, Maria. And I want to just say that we're about halfway done with our time already. And so um, there's so much that you can say. And every time I visit it, I just learn more and more. And to tour the, the Golden Taipei, to see the winery, to see the brewery, all of these are, are each one of them in and of itself is, is it, it's, it, it's a wonder. It's not, to, you don't just, you, you, you don't just uh, appreciate that it exists, but you appreciate how they went about making these things, the, the quality that it has gone into it, the, the care into everything that the Corey family does. What I want to go back and I want you to say, so, Daoud was supposed to become the priest of the next generation of how many yeah. priests in, consecutively before were in your fam were in his family going back um, all serving so the many. church. His his grandfather was the parish priest that helped build the church that we pray in today of Saint George. So his grandfather was the priest. His uncle, uh, so his grandfather is Father Daoud Huri. That's why all of the firstborn sons have the same name. So my husband is Daoud Khoury and our parish priest now is Father David, Father Daoud Philip Khoury because every son, every firstborn child uh, gets the name. So my husband got off the hook since his cousin was willing to serve the church. So then it was okay that he wasn't a priest. And then of course his, his uh, cousin, Bishop uh, Dimitri Khoury has served the church. So it's been um, many people, and also his aunt was uh, at Gethsemane, uh, Mother Elizabeth, but her birth name is Eleanor, and that's why my daughter Elena has the name Eleanor, Elena Noor Khoury, from the wonderful aunt that was at Gethsemane. And because, of course, she didn't have children, no one would hear her name, and we thought it was honorable to name our child after, you know, the... Well, actually, we named our child Eleanor because we were fighting. I wanted to name my child Christina, <laughs> and David wanted to name my child Sabrina. So we didn't have a Sabrina. We didn't have a Christina. So this nice yes, aunt who's yes, you know, we know how that can, we know how that can be. <laughs> so, but I I want to just make certain that I have the the facts straight. Wasn't it eight generations of clergy going back from the grandfather? So my husband's roots in the village father go. 600 years in the village of Taibe, but it's not eight generations. Okay. It's uh, over, um, it's over maybe four generations. Okay. But we do have Father Constantine Nasser, who has a beautiful chapel that you've prayed in next to the hotel. And he has 14 generations oh, he's of the serving one. the priesthood the for his yeah. family, where he's a priest and his brother is a priest and his uh, father was the priest, so he has fourteen generations of serving the priesthood, a yeah. little bit more than than my husband David. So, um, I'm going to uh, now. How do I get back to where I was before? I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I took a couple of pictures that I saw in that one uh, story about Taipei. And I wanted you to just speak a little bit about what life is like for the families that continue to live there. So I have this picture. You you recognize these people in this picture? Well, these are people that visit. Yes, this is the new mayor of Taiba, by the way, on the right. Okay. Yeah, I thought so. Well, and, how did and, you get that nice picture? He wasn't a mayor at that time. How did people know he it, might be the next mayor? That's this funny. was... This was in the pit. You can see the icon uh, above the little the girl's head. But this picture was uh, accompanied the article that you were quoted in. In yeah. Uh, so in this is uh, so this is Father Jack on the left, and he is the priest of the Blue Church that you saw. But next to him is the current mayor of Taiba, which at that time he was not the mayor. I don't know what year this is. Uh, and this beautiful young girl, she's now twenty two. My son didn't marry her. Everyone in Taiba is very angry because. They wanted him to marry a nice girl from Taipei. He married a nice girl from Ramallah. I sent you a photo on the on your I, phone with. Do you want to uh, show that right now? But I don't know how you can say no. We should continue with the pictures that you have. But I meant this lovely girl is just a beautiful young lady. I tried to marry her to a doctor in Bethlehem, but you know people just don't listen to my matchmaking. But if I was charging them two thousand dollars, like the Jewish singles or the Greek 
think, you know, the official online things charge you so much money to match make you they believe them but so I, so are are the youth of taipei leaving yeah yeah father they are going to australia and going everywhere for just a better life but and so, this lovely lady lived across from the church father and he, she has actually passed away uh mm -hmm. and this is a photo that's taken right across from saint george greek orthodox church where we pray mm -hmm. And her name is Yvonne. She's just passed away the last few years, but she was a nice elderly widow that I used to always visit, of course. Anything else that you want to tell us about the what life is like in Taipei before we move on? You wanted to speak yes, about the Holy I wanted, Fire. I wanted, I, I wanted to please mention to you that uh, being here in the Holy Land, it's very violent. It's very tragic. Terrible things happen. We have no freedom. But one of the most beautiful celebrated events and ceremonies is the miracle of the holy fire which happens for us on holy saturday and the miracle of the holy fire there's a lot of write-ups a lot of videos you know online that people could view but it's a very uh beautiful experience to be a christian in taibe it's a very beautiful experience to go to Jerusalem, of course, and receive the holy fire. But because Palestinians are not allowed to go unless they have permits and it's gotten stricter and stricter the last few years, the holy fire, when the miracle happens, travels to us with the Boy Scouts from Jerusalem when it's received from the life-giving tomb of Christ, going to Bethlehem for the surrounding villages of Bethlehem and going to Ramallah for us for all the 45 villages, the ones that are Christians, that have Christian churches, to go to Ramallah to pick the flame and to bring it with the Boy Scouts uh, to their village, whether it's Berzeit or Jifna or Taibe like us or Abud. These are the surrounding you know, Christian villages to me or, or Nablus. Uh, we have a small Christian community in Nablus. Uh, we march and chant and place it on the altar so that we will go back at midnight to celebrate you know the midnight resurrection uh, service so the Maria, miracle of the Holy fire happens about 2 p.m and by the time it travels to taiba it's about 5 p.m and we have a number of pictures that document that that you sent to me this picture right here i also got off of the internet and it's some some of the altar boys i believe from from the the greek orthodox church right I don't think this is the procession of the Holy no, Fire. This, this is, is just a scene no, in the choir. This, this is our church, and this is the celebration of the Day of Orthodoxy. Oh, Sunday of Orthodoxy. Okay, sure. They're yeah. carrying the icons outside of the church. Wonderful. Yeah, because we Our, march around the church three times with the icons. So this gives us a little sense of the look of the community, if it's just the, the men of the community. Here's... Uh, uh, a younger Maria um, explaining something of an, it's a museum that they have in Taipei, right? Yeah, this is the parable house, Father, which shows how people lived 2,000 years ago where wealthy people lived up and their animals lived down and their barns and their food was in their house. Uh, and so this is a beautiful uh, space that is now being renovated to show in the time of Christ, how you know people lived, so that the wall behind me there, when the man in the gospel story says he wants to knock down his barns because he doesn't want to share his um, food with others, he'd rather make more space in the barns. That's what he's talking about. Those walls in the back are the barns that he might be talking about. Um, anything else you want to say about that? I have this picture as well, which looks to me to come from maybe the Roman Catholic Church, but it was under uh, Taipei. This too. is this is this is the this is the chapel under the Latin Church, which is the chapel of Charles de Fold, which uh, he is a famous uh, French historian, and he he documented and wrote about his life being here in Taipei. And this is a, a private chapel under the Latin church that was renovated by, by a local person. And it has some of the artifacts that people used to use 2000 years ago to harvest their land and the clothing that they would wear. Interesting. So now I think we move on. Oh, I, I did. The, I, now I have the, the more pictures about the your industries. So 
here's the Taipei Beer Golden label. Yeah, and the and the barley on the left and the right we get from Belgium and from France, and the hops on the bottom we get from uh, Bavaria and the Czech Republic, one of the best places to get hops from. And those barrels are the wooden barrels, how they used to make beer in Egypt 5,000 years ago. So making beer is an old uh, art craft in, uh, in the Middle East. And the sun setting here on the hills of Taibe, the sunset, the sun for my husband is the symbol of hope and the symbol for a better future for Palestine. And Taibe, of course, he was so proud to be from Taibe. He named it where we make it, the beer, but because Taibe means good, pleasant, or for food, delicious, they thought this is a perfect name for the yeah, product delicious type of beer, beer, which is in 18 countries in the world now. It's in San Francisco as well, and New York and Florida and Boston, of course. This is, and this is Madis. This is Madis, our first female brewer in Palestine. She's also a Helena College graduate, and she is Nadim's uh, child. She's the same age as Elena, my child. This is your niece. Yes. And, and she studied beer making? No, she studied at Helena College, but her father helped her to make beer. Oh. And she had on the job training, and then she went to China and to many locations in, in Europe. So she's like, on the job trained by by her dad and she's the first female to brew beer in palestine and in the middle east and this is uh canaan uh Corey. my my son has the same name canaan because they both have the grandfather's name but he went to harvard and then stanford and uc davis which is one of the few places you can study um, uh, brewing science and he is uh, our new master brewer and he also makes the wine we are the first palestinian boutique winery and so i'm sharing these um uh not to promote the businesses of the Gori family to show everyone to show obedient children that <laughs> listen to their moms and dads <laughs> their industriousness and the that uh, it truly you have to be there, right, Angela? You just have to be there and walk around the hotel and the winery and the brewery to appreciate the the artistry in which they do everything. But now I think we move on to the holy fire and it's eight o'clock. So that, that's about right in our timing. You wanted to share with us one of one of the most important experiences of the Christians in Palestine. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, Talk to us about this miracle that's been that we know recorded has been happening for at least 1700 years now from the from the time that the first church of the resurrection, also known as Church of the Holy Sepulchre, was built and that uh, the, the miracle of the Holy Fire. So I'll let you take it from here. Here we are. Yeah, so this is a very crowded space. And the only time I got into the church myself and took the kids was in the year. 2001 because there were hardly any pilgrims we had an uprising here it was very violent so that was like one of the very few times i've been there three times i meant but it was during those uprising years 2001 2002 when pilgrims were not coming because they were too scared that's when i actually got in the front and i wanted to be in the front and i kept fighting and the priest i said i have to be in the front i gotta write about this i gotta tell people how the holy fire happens and then the local monk there told me in greek and that means, you know, my child. It's not only with the eyes that we see. So he was trying to kick me out of the way because, you know, the ambassador had to be there and the Greek council and all those other Greek dignitaries. But uh, Maria, you remember when we the last time we came, I had my Kumbaro Dr. John Mamalakis and his family and our godson Marcos. Marcos and John went back this year and he chanted the entire holy week at the holy sepulcher but on the the only church that they could the only service that they couldn't be at was this the holy fire they were forced into into the <laughs> courtyard but he still he still said to me father it's the real thing like they they experienced mm -hmm. the miracle as well and uh so the next picture these are all the pictures you sent to me yeah so this is how it's crowded inside the church and all the lights are turned out. It's the only time of the year that there's no lights in the Holy Sepulchre. So everything is put out. And then um, the Greek Orthodox patriarch goes inside the life-giving tomb of Christ. And he will come out 
with the flame and proclaim Christ is risen. Wow. And then everyone would light their candles. And then people are putting the candle in their face, in their beard, in their hair, and they don't get burned. This happens in the first few instants of the miracle of the holy fire. Right, right. The, it's hard the, to even, believe this unless you experience it. It is just not something that's... I, on, my, on my podcast on Ancient Faith Radio called Signs in Our Times, one of the podcasts, I, I actually wrote it while it, it was early, early Holy uh, Saturday. Um, it, but it, when the, it was the afternoon of Holy Saturday in Palestine, and I was listening. So it was before I even went into church for the services on Holy Saturday morning, the Paroti Anastasi. But I was listening to the live broadcast of it and writing my podcast at the, at the same time. And I document, uh, you know, it's been documented much better than my podcast. But if you want to listen to something that talks about this, this miracle and kind of hear my, my own reaction as the fire comes out of the sepulcher, you can... Uh, you can tune into that as well. So the fire then is taken all over the place, right? And we know it goes to various Orthodox countries um, that where it's been, it's able to be flown there in time yes. for so them it to disseminate in it before the university. It flies in private jet, like to Russia, to Greece, to Cyprus, to Romania, to Serbia, to flights that are less than three, four hours from Tel Aviv. And, and every year for the last several years, it's been also live broadcast, right? The coming yeah, of the, in the last of the year, fire. because this year, this year I was not in uh, the Holy Land. I was in Guatemala and I actually experienced and followed everything online on YouTube video live. So it was yeah. wonderful since uh, in Guatemala, they don't even have a priest. They were really suffering. And my daughter was in the hospital with a baby. I had to be home. And it was the first year in my life that I could not go to church from the time that I'm, you know, four or five years old in Tripoli in front of Profitis Elias Church, where my father hands me, you know, the candle and says, Christos Anesti. And I remember lighting my candle. Ever since that day, I've been in church for the resurrection service. So just imagine how... God is good to me and God loves me that I saw the live broadcast of the whole miracle of the Holy fire while I'm in Guatemala and I couldn't go to church. I, I thought it was a very beautiful thing, beautiful way to use technology since there's so many stories out there about how technology is used in a bad way, you know? So speaking of technology, you sent me a video clip of the Boy Scout parade bringing the Holy fire and I'm going to play it now. Oh, wait, I think oh, I might have okay, to go okay. back. I think I have to go back for a second um, to uh, to this screen because I might have to I have to click on something for before I begin sharing. So I'm actually going to go out for a moment, go back into share screen and optimize for video and sound. Now we'll go back in um, to the slideshow. Uh, and go back to this screen here. So this is how we march from the edge of the village where our Orthodox priest with a Melkai priest, with a Roman Catholic priest, they don't believe in the miracle of the fire. It's only an Orthodox ceremony. But, you know, out of respect, everyone in the whole village marches and all of the priests participate. But it goes only to our altar, and they can follow it. This is in front of the Taiba Golden Hotel. We're also having the choir, and the choir is chanting hymns that are resurrection hymns. And they have the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts, and then they have the Honorable Scouts, which are the elderly that were scouts from 100 years ago that the scouts were established. But they're like now in their 80s, and like 78. It's wonderful to see these 80-year-olds and 75-year-olds mark, actually. So now the rest are pictures. And this is Father David Corey, who has the same name as my husband, David Corey. My husband is um, 
the right former here. mayor of Taibe. Yeah, that's David. And on the left is Father Jack Kuri. He's the Melkite priest. Uh, and my husband served as mayor for eight years in the village. And it was time for someone else to do the job because it's a kind of job where you can't please 100% of the people 100% of the time. And you have to have your home open from 7 a.m. to midnight because there's no social security here. There's no educational grants. There's no... Um, anything so people go to the church or to the mayor for help getting closer to the to the church when they take the light into the church do yes. they, they is there any type of a ceremony of lighting the vigil lamp on the altar in the afternoon so that you then take the yes. the, the holy so, fire frame for the evening so this whole marching is in order to take it to the altar and light the candle on the altar. And then there's prayers and reading the gospel outside. And this is five o'clock in the afternoon. And this is how it came to us. This is a tradition. Now, this family, uh, first it was our cousin, Brahim Khoury, that kept bringing the fire. Now his son, Philippe Khoury, brings it. And before him, it was his uncle, Father uh, excuse me, Father uh, Abraham Khoury that used to bring. So it's a tradition in the Khoury family. Uh, our, our cousin, um, Abraham Khoury, brings the miracle of the Holy Fire. He used to be able to go to Jerusalem before um, 67. Uh, but, but, you know, when Israel reoccupied the territories, and especially when they made the two-state solution, in um, 1994, we no longer could go in without permits. This but is before the last. That, this, this is, is the last uh, picture that you sent me, Maria. Yeah. So this is Father walking with, holding the flame, the miracle of the holy fire, fire walking, so he could place it on the altar and light the candle on the altar. And he's still halfway there. I love the joy of the little boy down below. Or is that a little girl? I think maybe that's yes. a girl. I think, it's, I think it's a little girl. Yeah. And you know, Father, what's very interesting, uh, during the miracle of the Holy Fire, there's always a Muslim and a Jewish presence as well. So the miracle is happening to be a witness for Christ's light, Christ's love in front of all. So isn't it funny that... Uh, and usually... Yeah. And usually they end up to be like reporters or local people that come to see, wow, what are we doing? We Christians, aren't we weird? So they come from the surrounding Muslim villages to just check what we're doing. Because we're surrounded by 16 Muslim villages. And we are the only all Christian village that is left currently in the Holy Land. Where before 1948, there were like 20 some percent Christians here. Jerusalem was half Christian. Bethlehem was half Christian. Now we're just hardly any Christians left. 1.3% of the whole population. Maria, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop now to let everyone ask whatever questions they want to about everything you've said thus far. And then if, if there's time, I have slides of um, some of those locations that were close by. The first, though, the first is of the Church of St. Fotini, Jacob's Well, and Father Justinos. Um, who I think you have the great blessing to to live so close to him. You know, truly he will be canonized someday a saint of the church. Uh, and it, this person who has heroically defended this site in the midst of, you know, how many times now has, has he, they've tried to kill him like 23 times. Uh, oh yeah, um, very but, terrible attacks on Father, on Yeronda Ustinios, more than 23 times, yeah. Let's, Thank God he let's, survived. Let's let, let anybody who thus far would, you don't have to ask a question. You can just make a comment uh, about what you've heard tonight. Maybe not what you expected to hear, but I think the right way to appreciate what everything else we're going to see about the Holy Land is to, to see the struggle that the Christians that still live there are going through to keep the faith. I want to flip my camera so you could see them, the lights of Jerusalem before you go anywhere. All right. Um, but yeah, I'm listening to any questions. 
So I'm, gonna, yeah, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna so put it on uh, speaker view so we get I get the view I, at least. I I, I want to show you that we see the lights of the outskirts of Jerusalem from Taiba because we're more than 900 meters above sea level. So I'm currently in the most ancient village in Palestine, but I'm 900 meters above sea level. So here on my right, these are the lights of Jerusalem. I'm not sure you can see them, but then a little bit to the left, uh, if I am at the hotel, I see the lights on the opposite side of the Dead Sea. And on a clear crystal day, when we walk down the road to go to the Greek Orthodox Church, we can actually see the sparkle on the Dead Sea. It's really amazing. And when we are at the fourth century ruins of St. George, we look down, we see the Jordan Valley. That's where Mary of Egypt spent more than 40, 47 years uh, of her life asking for forgiveness from God. So uh, I don't know if you could see the lights, but I tried to show them to you. But that's the most significant thing to us of Jerusalem is the light of Christ, the miracle that happens every year there. And just to have this freedom to be able to celebrate uh, this, you know, in our church experience, but we have no freedom. I meant as Palestinian Christians, that's the terrible thing because all people can get into Jerusalem freely, except Palestinians need a permit. So just imagine it's crazy. You're 10 minutes away from the most holiest place of the world. But if you're Palestinian, you can't get there to light a candle. Isn't it crazy? Maria, um, I don't, no one's asking any questions. So I want, I, if I'm going to, I'm going to wait another 20 seconds. And then uh, if nobody asks a question, I, I'm going to ask you to tell the story of, of what happened um, when your house was almost burned down. And, and, you know, the, that that just just to get a sense of the another sense of the that what your what your family goes through and the Christians are are going through even living in in Taipei with everyone who's who's surrounding them and and the ongoing struggles that happen. But any questions first from anyone else? <laughs> yes, Angela. Um, thank you, Maria. I always love hearing your explanation. I'm just curious. When I had first met you, I don't know. It was during one of the um, tours, I guess, that you did where you were selling the books, right? Um, many, many years ago. And I remember that was the first time I had ever heard um, about the Palestinian Orthodox Christians and how the message of the United States to its people was always about poor Israel and what they're going through. I'm just curious to see, do you feel like your message of the Palestinians and the struggle has um, been heard and understood by more people in this country? Or are you still, are you still struggling? I mean, obviously you're trying to get the message out there, but I'm just curious from back then to now, if there has been any shift in under in the understanding of the Orthodox community here in, in the US about that role? Well, I, I think I'm talking to a dead wall because if my own classmates who are now prominent metropolitan and prominent bishops and priests can't even come to Taiba if they come as close as Jerusalem, but they're too scared to come to a Palestinian village. It's, it's, it's very sad. Uh, I don't, think my message is getting across to everyone because Israel is brought to you in your living room near and dear and the good guys and it's a democracy but it's a democracy for Jews only it's not a democracy for all humans so I think I think it's going to take a long time for the message to get across because we have uh, the same time as my my child's wedding happened uh, we were blessed that it was a peaceful day but in the next village over a few days before, hundreds of settlers, Jewish settlers, raided the village. The wedding that was taking place that day uh, couldn't take place. Hundreds of homes were burned, cars. It was a tragic attack. And, and just the whole world, America, closes their eyes on this. They don't want to know what's happening in Palestine. They don't want to know the attacks that, that are happening in Palestine because if Palestinian people are brought to you as terrorists, then it's okay to continue these things, these attacks, because Israel is the good guy and Israel is the democracy. But again, democracy for Jews only, not democracy for all humans. So I think some people have heard the message, but 
very, very difficult to fight the 50 million, 60 million evangelical Christians that believe in a strong Israel because come again. And God rest his soul, my professor, Father Stanley Herrick, has told me there's nothing I need to do for Christ to return again. I need to be alert. I need to be ready. I need to be strong in faith. But I was baptized a Christian following Christ onto Christ. So I am the new Israel, the Israel right now on the ground with the gunships and the tanks uh, is not the Israel of my gospels. And there's this huge, big misunderstanding of interpreting the gospel. And it's really hard to fight that. That's why my message is not getting across to anyone. Maria, thank you for sharing that. I see that we have Katrina. Is this Katrina Batar who's on tonight? Or is this another Katrina? Okay, well, whoever it is. Um, Sorry, uh, Katrina Katrina von Hoyer Costas. I couldn't find my mute button. Oh, okay. Um, All right. Maria Maria was very kind and um, met my daughter on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land with Mother Agapia. Um, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Katrina, for joining us. I, if you were this, another Katrina that I've known, we we actually had as a speaker in a previous series that 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 we did. I was who who also has roots in the Holy Land, and um, I was going to invite her to say something to corroborate the, some of the things that Maria has been been sharing with us. But thank you. We're so uh, glad that you you've joined us as well. Um, so uh, we have about ten minutes left. Um, a little, little bit more than that. Um, Maria, sh shall we, shall we? Did, go could on? I, is, sorry, sorry. I thought you were, if I could interrupt you, I had put Please. a question in the, in the chat. Oh, I'm I was sorry. Just, I missed it. No, 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 it's fine. I was just curious uh, why the other two Christian churches that, uh, that you mentioned, uh, why do they not recognize the Holy Fire? It's, I can't it's imagine. Not the, it, it's not the churches. It's the Catholic Church in general across the world. It's it's a, a celebrated Orthodox ceremony. Only Orthodox Christians celebrate the miracle of the Holy Fire. It's not celebrated in the Catholic world around the world, not just my two churches here in Tibet. But, but Maria, you said that they, they participate in the parade, but they don't really believe yes. in kind of the miraculous origin of the I, Holy Father. Thought, to them, I they think it's just... I thought to bring that to your attention. I thought to yeah. bring that to your attention. Yeah. Yeah, even those, even pe some people who go can walk away and think, it just looked like a flame to me and I didn't see anything. It's really rare the persons who see more divine manifestations of the divine energies of God and the Holy Fire. But um, there's there's a wonderful book on the Holy Fire that was published by someone out of Greece that documents, you know, 70 cases throughout his 70 different cases from places all over the world of people who've gone on pilgrimage and have experienced the miraculous aspects of, of this miracle that happens every year, the vigil lamps lighting on their own, um, uh, the the seeing bluish white light, flashes flashes of light. Our our own Metropolitan Maximus gave one of the most vivid accounts of anybody that had ever heard. Where when he went for the first time and he was standing outside of the Holy Sepulchre when the patriarch went inside, the patriarch he before the patriarch even received the light. Metropolitan saw in the dome of the church a bluish white light in the ball going around in a circle so fast that it it formed almost a ring. Now I want to I want to um, just make a, a little statement why this would happen to somebody like Metropolitan Maximus because he was a child at heart and he had but Met Metropolitan Maximus had the most simple and uh, devout and deep faith of any uh, any hierarchs. You know, we've had amazing hierarchs in Pittsburgh. Bishop Erasmus, who may be uh, canonized, the first saint of our archdiocese someday. Uh, Metropolitan Maximus, mother of God, visited him, and he would tell the kids at camp in very, you know, matter-of-fact way when they ask, would ask him questions like, "Have you ever seen the Virgin Mary?" Well, yes, you know, <laughs> but but so he first saw this bluish white light. And then he saw the light descend into the Holy Sepulchre, almost like lightning. 
And then the, then the patriarch came out and then the Roman Catholic priest next to him put his hand in the fire, which was the flame was, this, you know, this high uh, and higher and held it in there. And so the Metropolitan said, well, I'm going to do that, too. So he put his hand in the fire, of the flame and held it in there for a while. And, you know, if you put your if this is a candle and the flames are right there and you put your finger right here, it burns. And he put his hand in the flame of a torch that the you know the fire was this big because the patriarchal's third three candles for for many seconds and didn't get burned at all and and as so as maria says there are those people that experience this and therefore believe there are many others who don't experience this and 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 if we we don't have that simple childlike faith i even know hierarchs in in, in jerusalem you know who who question Things. There's that story of the man who hid in the, the Holy Sepulchre because a, a very devout man, he had been sold into slavery, escaped, came, had served for many years at, uh, in, as one of the protectors of the holy sites. But he doubted and he, he made a hiding place in there and he witnessed what actually happened. And then he felt this tremendous sense of, of, of remorse for that he had doubted at all. And he confessed to the patriarch. And that's one of the wonderful stories in that book. Anyways, I'm sorry, Maria, I'm taking up your time. Can you just actually talk about the um, when the fire went through the pillar? And because I think that's a beautiful story. It was one of the um, other Christian denominations who tried to go into the sepulchre, right? It was the Armenian, the Armenian Orthodox Church that also have had in historically a very strong presence there. And they had um, basically convinced the 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 Muslims to uh, to allow them to go and receive the fire that year, and they could do it because the Muslims are in control of the country, and you know there were these agreements that that were abided to, but but if they wanted they could they could you know just overlook that, and and that year the the patriarch of the Greek Orthodox Church of Jerusalem. Uh, was standing outside the front entrance of the Church of the Resurrection. They locked him out. They locked him out. He was locked out. And that year, the light came down outside of the church, out of the column. And you still see this column to this day where it's melted. <laughs> and you see the opening, you know, and where the flame came and, and lit the patriarchs, um, the patriarchs, uh, and isn't that the same year, Maria? Then that the that the holy martyr who was who was up in the minaret, he was one of the callers. He he viewing this miracle, he began to proclaim the truth of the Christian faith and to proclaim God uh, uh, as he as he is truly. And he was was it was it Ahmed? Was his name? I, I forget and then, now. Uh, Ahmed. His name was Ahmed, and they 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 threw them off the pillow. They killed him because he proclaimed Christ. Yeah. And he is, what I wanted to say, so he is the a Muslim that the Orthodox, I mean, became recognized yeah. as a saint because he confessed Christ because he was so impressed. And also, what I want to just say two things, Father, is that because Christians are always fighting, it's a Muslim family that has the keys to the Holy Sepulcher that opens the doors for the Christians to go in. And that year, which forgive me, I forget what year it was that the pillar uh, was. Uh, the holy fire came from the pillar and the Greek Orthodox uh, patriarch was locked outside. But the miracle of the holy fire came from the life-giving tomb, but was not able to be received by the Armenian patriarch that was in the tomb, but instead outside of the column where the flame was and the miracle of the holy fire was the Orthodox yes. patriarch received it. Yeah. Because they, yeah. they thought, well, if the miracle is happening in the tomb, anyone inside the tomb will receive it. But it's a, it's a special statement, I meant to say, that you know we are part of the true faith, that we are believing in the living God, uh, and that you know the Greek Orthodox patriarch has this tradition of being the only one to receive the miracle of the holy fire. Shall we, shall we just show the rest of the slides that I have and you can comment on them just for a little bit, Maria? Um, if you have time, I don't want to be keeping any, anyone, but... To... I think there's time. I think there's time. So now this is the, the continuing... Oh, now you're having pictures of where Yeronda, Yeronda 
uh, live in us, yeah. as well in right. St. Portuguese. And he is just the only one of the few walking saints that I know. I, I'm sure the church is going to recognize him as a saint because uh, while he's stuck in curfew, actually, no one goes in and out of Nablus in Jacob's well. He did all the floors in mosaic. He uh, wrote all the icons in, in the church. He's an amazing human being. The outside of the church on the left hand side with the two towers and one of the icons that he made on the on the huge icons on the inside of the church. This is a picture of the actual well. So the Old Testament uh, uh, account of, of Jacob building a well in uh, in Samaria and um, that well exists to this day. And you go as pilgrims right here, all the way on the left is uh, Maria's daughter, Elena, um, who... Oh, it's good you said that, Father. I wouldn't have recognized her. <laughs> wow. That's a long time ago. This is, this is 2016. And there's, there's Father Justinos. And there's me from four years ago. Still had a little, a little brown and... In, in my hair, not so much gray as I have in white these days, but um, Father Justinus is just such a remarkable person, but I want you to share your, you know, your impressions of being with him. This is not oh. 2016. This is our last trip in 2019 when we brought uh, this woman, Merlandi, who was a convert to Orthodoxy from, she, she was, she went through many yeah, a long, long search and had a real spiritual battle and struggle in her life, but came to orthodoxy and was baptized with the name Fotini and came on her pilgrimage. And Father Eustinus, when he saw her, he grabbed her with the cane and pulled her by the neck. And he said, you are staying here like that and, and pulled her right in. Yeah, Yeranda Eustinus is a very special person. I have asked him to come out to give us a blessing at the hotel. And following that is when Elena got married. And then the other time when he came out uh, to the hotel um, with his blessing, my son Kanan got married. So when that happened and I took him the wedding invitation, he wasn't there because he was sick. He was in Greece. He, he's having an operation. And then I, I called him up and I said, you must come to Taibe one more time. I will... Uh, pay for the taxi, pay for anyone to bring you, please. I need one more blessing. So my son Constantine will get married. And um, I hope he might come the third time. So that third child will get married. But um, Maybe. You, you feel you feel his you feel his holiness by being around him. He's a very humble man. I don't know if he speaks any English to anyone because I never speak to him in English. Did he ever speak to you in English, Father? Because I always speak he, to him in he, Greek. He doesn't. In this picture, he's speaking in Greek, and I'm translating for the OCF uh, group into English. But at one point, he turned to Presbyteria and he said something to her about our life together in Greek. And it was... You know, there's no way that he could have really known these things. And President Ted and I just looked at each other in shock. And Elena, and Elena heard it. I didn't, I didn't, I chose not to feed it to all of the people, but it just showed me. And and more, almost every time I've seen him, I've seen something of like that gift that the holy elders have of being able to say something about your life, you know, and it's just, it's, you feel like, you're you're an open book before him, you know. He's one of those persons that um, just is is between earth and heaven already. Yeah, yeah it reminds me, I should call up and check on him. So it, it's about eight thirty, but you sent those pictures, so I want to show them. I, I it's the other slides that I have are from uh, this is Sebastia, which Father Justinus also overlooks. The place he where St. John the Baptist church, was murdered. He built the Church of St. John the Baptist. Uh, be, before, um, before we go, I wanted to tell you that all the churches are named St. George in the Middle East because St. George is written up in the Quran and M Muslim invaders were scared to knock down churches that had the image of St. George 
whereas other churches that had Christian symbols were knocked down and destroyed. So all the Christians caught on and they named all the churches St. George because we think of him as house insurance, building insurance, a way to protect buildings. So I wanted to make sure I say that before we finish because I remember I was going to tell you the secret of St. George and that's it. So Father Eustinus has raised all of the money to, the, so this is the old palace, we you know, where Salome danced of Herod. Uh, and this is the location of the church, the ancient church, and the actual location of the martyrdom or the, the beheading of St. John the Baptist in Sephistia. He has everything ready, but the Israeli government is not giving him permission to go forward with the building of this church. And he really doesn't have the cooperation of the, of the local Muslims. And now, Maria, you've you shared with me that this is one of the places where there's the most conflicts going on between the Palestinian Muslims and the and the Jews, uh, Jewish settlers, right? Well, we have a lot of attacks from settlers uh, entering Nablus. Um, so last, yes, we have a lot of attacks from the Jewish settlers. But uh, Father, but Yeronda Eustinius built a small church there in Sebastia. Um, he did. For St. John. A smaller version, yeah. not as you're saying with the palace, yeah. but he did build, I don't know how many meters it is, but he, he did finish off a small church in honor of St. John. Yes. Yeah. Here's someone else that you are friends with that you introduced us to as a remote, oh, yeah. this remarkable is mother, person. This is this Sister is Martha, Maria. now Mother she Mary. Uh, yeah, she took on the new name. Runs, runs another a, walking a, living saint. Yeah, runs a school another in Bethany. Walking, living saint. Who who runs a school for for mostly uh, for for girls, right? And in Bethany. And she's uh, she's a nun at Gethsemane, but her job is to be the director of the Bethany Girls School, and um, you know, it takes a lot of guts to do what she does. I I really admire Mother Maria. But um, and she's been a wonderful speaker to the students when when you've been here, Father. Right. Everyone really kind right. of loves her. Gets her own journey by... to to orthodoxy and her because own experience with the Mother yes. of God, calling her to come to the Holy Land in a very mystical way. She has um, German background. And I, I ended with years. with so these two places are actually in in bethany right so much closer yes. to jerusalem tomb, but, tomb of lazarus is in bethany and mother maria is in bethany with a school yes but they are we have the wall being built so uh if jesus was going to walk into jerusalem like he did a palm sunday you couldn't do it anymore because the wall that israel put up here we are in the tomb of, of Lazarus. So this kind of connects us with the beginning of the slideshow again, because it was after the raising of Lazarus that Christ went and and passed. Well, it was, we, we don't know exactly yes. how much time he stayed, stayed in a frame. It was, right. It was after Lazarus because they wanted to get him and to punish him. And in the old days, there were two ways that you could be protected if you were an accused criminal. One way was to go to the um, temple and touch the holy altar and it was the job of the high priest to protect you from the authorities and another way was to go to a civilian population like Ephraim and the civilian population was known in Ephraim to protect accused criminals so we think that's why Jesus chose Ephraim uh, because the people would you know help him not to be picked up by the authorities we don't know how long he stayed no but the holy mother of God was here and the disciples and we have a special icon oh i want to show you the special icon which belongs just to taipei you know how we have special icons for the holy mother of god uh in different countries the one in jerusalem there's one in russia there's several in greece in tinos and this is can you this is the icon for ephraim the holy mother of god with christ when she's holding the pomegranate fruit is the image of can you um, move the camera down just a little bit maria so we can see the whole like icon. like this sorry how can um, you see it now we're seeing no it's cutting off we only see the top of her head can you can you pan oh. down 
can like you this? the camera now we see a little bit of Jesus but we're not seeing the whole icon yet a little bit further like down this? and a little bit to your left keep going like down that? keep going down <laughs> keep going down okay good right. now we're seeing now we're seeing it all so this you, is the okay. icon of can the, you see the icon this is yes. the holy mother of God of Ephraim of our location of Taibe. And the way that this is different is she's holding the pomegranate fruit, which is one of the fruits of the Old Testament. That's wonderful. But this, is, this is a special icon of the Holy Mother of God for this area where it's just like, you know, how there's special icons like the Jerusalem miraculous icon. Mm -hmm. Amen. So our... Uh, Holy Mother of God, it's not that it's a miraculous icon, but I meant I just wanted to show you this image that we have an icon to remember Jesus coming into the village with his Holy Mother and with his disciples. And it's this image. Thank you, Maria. Yeah, um, sorry. I, we, I, I kept you too long. No, 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 not at all. We could listen to you. And and I and I I um, will always always treasure our time that we've had together. Um, as as this me, me has too, Father Theodore. And you know the most special time we had together when I was praying at Holy Cross Chapel because I hadn't been there since like whatever 1979, and it was 2017. And you were so humble to come over on the other side because. I always feel bad. I see people and then I don't see them after the chapel. So I was most humbled that you came to say hello. So I was thinking, gosh, isn't this great? I hope it's like this when I go to God's heavenly kingdom that I meet all my <laughs> friends and they will be humble enough to greet me, you know, when uh, they're uh, on the other side. Yeah. So thank you for that. That was just, uh, I treasure you, every moment that I had in your beautiful home and here in, you know, our home of Taiban. I hope you are able to come with with pilgrims, you know, many times more. Let's pray for peace for this land. Well, that that is the plan. So I'm I'm letting everyone know uh, that we are hoping to visit Maria and the Holy Land once again, and at least say three or four days in in, in Taipei as our home base to be able to go to the places that are in and around it, but still have the hospitality that they show in in Taipei. Um, at the end of February, the beginning of March, as of right now, I, I sent the schedule to her daughter, Elena, and she's going to work on it. And uh, in the meantime, we're talking to the White Star Travel Agency and, and other people that are helping us to pull this together. Uh, we do have a list of 80 names, and I can only take 50. But I think when everyone wow. sees, sees the actual um, details of the trip, including the increased uh, costs of things uh, for travel yeah. and 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 and, and the elsewhere. Have the, those to be numbers, very expensive. Yes. the numbers will probably very go expensive. down a, a little bit. So if you're uh, Dimitria, you're on the list. Angela, I think you told me you're on the list. Jane, maybe you told me. Sula, I don't. Know, whoever has told me already, Dionysia, um, yeah. You all, anyone who's already on the list, you get the, the first dibs, and and then if there's space after that, if we still have room to go up to 50, we'll we'll open it up to others. But um, we've been waiting since I first came here in 2000 and September of 2019, talking about this pilgrimage. Our parish has done pilgrimages in the past, but it's not going to be like this one. It's it's this one uh, with the help of the Curry family is. It's just really unique. And we thank you, Maria. Thank you for tonight. I think we need to thank close you. because we've gone uh, an hour and 40 minutes. Um, but thank you all for your patience with us and staying hanging in there. And may God bless us all that to either um, make it one day to the Holy Land in, in, in our physical bodies, but all to be gathered into the New Jerusalem and uh, to be a part of the Holy Zion in his uh, heavenly kingdom, which um, we experience wherever we are when we live our life in Christ and in the church. So may God help us to continue our journey all together. I can't tell you who it is next week. I wish I which I knew I I am trying to find some of the people, as I said earlier, who have come on pilgrimages with me in the past. 
or even somebody who, who's lived in the Holy Land, who's over here now, maybe I will talk to Sister Agapia um, and, and have uh, someone- Mother to Agapia. Mother, Mother Agapia, have, have, uh, have uh, our, our, our journey around the Holy Land continue next week. You'll look, look for the next invitation to find out more details. Let's, let's uh, if we can close with, let's see, what would be an appropriate prayer? It is, it is the feast of, uh, of the Prophetis Elias. Um, so I think I will um, chant, uh, if I can, the Apolitikian from him. This translation isn't the one I'm used to, but we'll, we'll make it work. Thank you, Katrina. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the incarnate angel and the prophet summit and boast, the second forerunner of the coming of Christ our God, O glorious Elias, who from above sent down to Elijah the grace to dispel sickness and to cleanse leopards, abounds therefore in healing for those who honor her him. Lord Jesus Christ, our God, through the prayers of the Holy Prophet, uh, Elias, Elijah, all the saints of the Holy Land, have mercy upon us, watch over and protect, especially the Christians of Taipei and the Kuri family and all the Christians in the Holy Land. Hear our prayer for peace for the people that live there that hoping against hope, we may can see um, that they can continue to live the life that they've been living and the, keep these holy sites uh, for others in the future to come and to venerate and to worship your holy name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Father. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.